Today we're going to be talking about the late great Jack Miner. Uh, at the age of 13, he and his family moved to Kingsville in southern Ontario, Essex County, where he lived most of his life. When he died in 1944, U.S. newspapers rated him the fifth most famous man in North America, after Ford, Edison, Lindbergh, and Rickenbacker. And in fact, uh, Jack Miner was a good friend of Henry Ford's and also Ty Cobb. He was labeled uh, by many the father of conservation. And in 1946, his family was actually approached by a government representative from Ottawa who proposed that the entire Northwest Territory be declared a national park and renamed the Canadian Jack Minor National Park. Instead, an act was unanimously passed in 1947, designating the week of April 10th, that's Jack's birthday, as Canada's National Wildlife Week, and its purpose was to commemorate Jack Miner's conservation efforts and to encourage public interest in the conservation field. In 1977, our very own Pierre Trudeau, in issuing a proclamation for National Wildlife Week, said, Jack Miner, with his vision and determination, is largely responsible for those conservation me measures in existence today. So joining me on the phone to talk about Jack Miner are two of his grandsons from Burlington, Ontario, is uh, the Reverend Robert Miner, who is a Baptist minister, and from uh, Kingsville in Essex County is Kirk Miner, who is the uh, manager of the Jack Miner Bird Sanctuary. Now, um, let's begin with, uh, with Robert. Uh, the, the first question is, who was Jack Miner, and why was he so well known? Well, I think you've uh, done a beautiful summary there, Simon. Mm -hmm. um, he was also a brick and tile maker uh, as an adult, as a child, and even as an adult. He was a hunter. He was a trapper of skunks. Mm -hmm. uh, what about his education? Was he? Um, how did he get involved in in the natural world? Now, this is an open question to uh, yeah, Kirk, to Kirk or Robert. Well. Well, Kirk, his, are you there? Yeah, Simon. In his, in his autobiography, he said that he only had three months public school education. That was in. Uh, in Ohio, so he didn't even have grade one. He couldn't read or write until his uh, mid thirties. Mm -hmm. And um, the um, uh, going uh, down the cr a little creek outside of what's now Westlake, Ohio. There's a Jack Miner birthplace there. On Do if anyone going through Cleveland, Dover Center Road, mm -hmm. uh, Dover Center doesn't exist, but the uh, birthplace. Uh, he would go to the creeks and follow pollywogs and clip their their tail off, and he had proof. Uh, just an ex as an example of how a polywog turned into a frog, and it was these uh, these experiments he did with nature outside, not in a classroom, that uh, had a, gave him his uh, unique uh, perspective on things. So he was also a devout uh, churchgoer as well. And how did that impact on his 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 love of nature and his his drive towards conservation? One uh, came across was let man have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. He began to see that God's blueprint for ideal humanity fit right in with what he had, uh, he had personally observed through nature. Right. It, he was also one of the first pioneers in wildlife management, wasn't he? Like, what motivated him to start the... Could you tell me more maybe about the Jack Minor Bird Sanctuary and what how, how that got started? Well, he... Um, you know, he was a converted Jesse James. He was a market hunter selling ducks and geese to uh, what he called rich people in Detroit, uh, just uh, over the border here in Essex County. And he um, he he thought that uh, the geese uh, and uh, recognized him as their deadly enemy. So it was the thought that crossed his mind: maybe they'd recognize a friend if he if they had one. And he flooded one of these uh, three foot pits that, uh, taking three feet of clay to manu manufacture brick and tile, which was his family business, he flooded it and purchased seven uh, clip geese from a neighbor near Amherstburg, uh, about 20 uh, miles from us here, and uh, and uh, they, the neighbors laughed at him, and uh, you're going to you're gonna do what? And he thought that maybe these geese, because they were so rare, it's hard to believe now the way they, the populations exploded with these resident geese in parks and golf courses, but they were just about wiped out in 1900. And they'd all winter before the refuge system, Jack Miners, with 1904, was implemented. Um, they'd all uh, winter in, uh, now we found out later, around Lake Madamesquite the, by the Atlantic in uh, North Carolina. 
So they'd be returning first week in April, and he thought maybe he could intercept it. He'd be a mile up. Mm-hmm. And none came in 1904, 5, 6, 7. April 2nd, uh, 1908, 11 circled the original, the seven uh, live decoys and came down from a mile up. So the way I try to remember is it's the first 7-11. They, uh, the 11 geese came down and joined them. The following year, 26 came, then 400. And then they started coming in the thousands by 1912. And it wasn't uh, how to attract them, but where the money was going to come to feed them. So that's basically uh, how we started the sanctuary. Uh, I've seen footage uh, from 1916 where the pond was occupied, like there are 20,000 20, Canadian geese. Right. And... Um, he was also he was also a pioneer in the his tracing and tracing migratory mm-hmm. uh, patterns of these geese. Could you get in, could you explain that what he was, yeah, what was I, involved in that? Um, the um, there was no a lot of people don't realize that uh, we had a phone call here a while back from an from an Eskimo up in the north up in James Bay in Indian and you went uh, he he said I, I understand your grandfather's work is only that is the only one that predates that of the government. And it wasn't government didn't do this, but Jack Miner he took a it was a mallard, black mallard, a cross with a black and a mallard, and in, in, in December 1909, and he put a just stamped his box, no, no, nothing, just box four eight Kingsville. A month later, it was recovered in Anderson, South Carolina, by a Dr. Bray, and this is considered the first complete record of where a bird was tagged and when and where it was recovered. And he dotted, he kept tagging these and. His, uh, since he was the only one in Canada, United States that was doing this, it was, uh, and it was dependent. Uh, they found out in 1916 that the, these birds, the ducks and geese, nested in the summer months in Canada, but spent the winter months in the United States. It was dependent on both co- uh, countries. So that was the uh, his uh, his log was uh, the kind of the blueprint for the the Migratory Bird Treaty of the, of 1916. Uh, dependent on for both Canada and the United States, uh, his uh, his work was uh, was, yes. was very important in, in the implementation of that. The uh, Migratory Bird Treaty between the U.S. and Canada. This was the act that placed the first restrictions on hunting, wasn't it? That given, Correct. Cons- giving consideration to the waterfowl populations for the future. What was unique about his his tags? Well, he he, uh, he said, I, I never had, in 1909, I mentioned right up till 1914, so that's a period of five years, he just was tagging box 4-8. But he said later on, I never had success in my tagging until I took God into partnership. And that was 1914, he got a, a calendar, uh, well, about this time of year from a Salvation Army girl in, in, in Kingsville, and he just put his back pocket, and the next day he discovered there was a verse for every every day of the... For, Tried to determine how to pass this on. He was trying to figure out how to pass this on, and he was going to use it for Christmas cards. And then a flock of ducks came in, and he said, stamp that on your blank verse of uh, your aluminum bands and make them missionaries of the year. But he said that, that he said he always thought that that came from God. looking um, up at these ducks and counting the stars behind them. He thought it was just, uh, it was just God's direct message to him to do that. And what was the impact of these uh, scriptural quotations when they were received by these trappers up north? And well, especially the, the, the um, missionaries in the Arctic said they'd never seen anything like it because the Indians and Eskimos would come to them and, and say, uh, you know, what God say this time? And the, and the, uh, the missionary would use uh, the tag, whether he used a lot of have faith in God, be not afraid, only believe, uh, let us consider one another, cast all your care upon God. There was... He wanted just something short on the on the verse that would hit the hunter in the heart, and uh, and the missionary said they'd never seen anything like this with the uh, natives uh, swarming to their churches to uh, decipher the uh, the message from this uh, Jack Miner in the south. So it, it's interesting, Simon, that mm-hmm. Kirk sends me emails uh, now and then of people that are still being impacted by the uh, duck and goose bands that Kirk is putting on, e- even in recent years. Well, the one I have in front of me, the the fellow's dad had just died a year ago, and his hunting buddy, age 34, is in liver failure. He says, the night before, I told him I would get a bird for him. My wife went with me and read our daily bread, which is a daily devotional on scripture. Your bird was a true blessing. Our spirit was lifted. My buddy is fighting to survive. 
and now they say he has a chance. I pray diligently for something to encourage us. You have no idea what your missionary word has done. God bless you all. And he, he got a, a, a duck, and it had a band on, and it said, Behold, I come quickly. It right. was just a tremendous encouragement. Well, what's what's interesting about Robert's report is this isn't coming from 1909. This is, two, what is it, dated, Robert, January 18th, 08? Yeah, just, just a few weeks ago. So that's, that's interesting. So you're still using the scriptural quotations. Yeah, we change every 2,000 bands on the ducks and every 1,000 on the geese. But okay. we're trying to use a few, uh, going back to the original... Uh, Right. You imagine what what Granddad had to do to hand stamp these, but oh, one goodness. letter at a time. Right. Oh you know, goodness. It's kind of menial. Well, we're going to have to draw this to a close. But just one quick question. I know that in Toronto we've we've got a there's a bit of a goose problem in that there are too many of them. How would how would uh, Jack deal with that? Well, he I don't know exactly. He try to convert a problem to an opportunity. I you know if. Uh, Relocate them to James Bay or something where they're, they're, they say they don't have enough geese. But what people don't realize, I'll, I'll try to be quick on this. There's seven subspecies, and the ones that have exploded the last 20 to 25 years are all these giant non-migratory lessers. Mm-hmm. Now, or gi- giant, um, not the, the non-lesser, uh, the giant migratory maximus um, that are a third larger than the geese that you see at Jack Minor that migrate from James Bay, which are called SJBP, Southern James Bay population, but um betting back to your you know it, it, i i just think that they have to uh because of the geometric progression and they have an averaging five young that's why quite often you see a flock of seven the the two uh, male and female parent mate for life and then the five young so but it, if they you know i just think that they they could try relocating a lot of these i know it's 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 tough in in a in a big city like toronto right. to to do it because no matter what you do you'd have opposition yeah okay well thanks so much for joining us this morning uh, kirk and robert we've been speaking with uh, kirk and robert minor the grandsons of jack minor the father of conservation